Hello everybody, this is Tim here again, here with Batathon number three. <laughs> Let's jump in here. A lot of people probably didn't think I was going to do this one, but... <clears throat> got Mask of the Phantasm and a double pack with Sub-Zero, which I also like Sub-Zero. But Mask of the Phantasm, it was a, the, the only theatrical released uh, Batman animated series film. Uh, just to jump into it, I'd give it four stars out of four. Great movie. Not perfect, but great. Not as good as the first Batman movie with Jack Nicholson and Michael Keaton, but better than Batman Returns and Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Um, uh, Mark Hamill is the Joker. Fantastic. Um, how they tie the Joker into Batman's past is great in the movie. Um, one problem with the movie, though, is that the movie was originally going to be released direct to video, but they Warner Bros. gave them some more money, <clears throat> and they decided to uh, amp up the animation a little bit more in certain spots and release it to theaters. And every now and then, though, the animation still feels like the animated series. It doesn't feel exactly big-budget, theater-worthy quality. But also, uh, in the scenes when it does feel big-budget, theater-worthy quality, it works really good. But even in the weaker animated scenes, uh, the story is so good in the movie that it makes up for it. It's basically a story that lets you know how Batman became Batman in the animated series, or why he decided to become Batman, or whatever, what is... Uh, uh, what his relationships, uh, or what his relationship with the love of his life was like in this universe. Um, uh, it's got the phantasm in it, basically, where it's, it's mask of the phantasm. So you get the phantasm in it, which is this cool, like, ghost of Christmas future looking creature, or, a, or a person, I mean. Um, it's a mystery who the phantasm is, but the, another problem with the movie is the mystery of who the phantasm is. It's very easy to figure out. <coughs> uh, it's uh, it's ob so obvious in the movie who it is. Um, but um, when you you when you watch it, you'll know. I don't want to. I'm not gonna go in too much to plots to these last couple of movies of Batman. That I'm gonna do that way. I can kind of wrap up the Batathon and move on to another set of movies. But basically, the Phantasm turns out to be Bruce Wayne's ex girlfriend. It's like, duh. <laughs> no, that's one another weak spot of the movie. But the actual Phantasm, though, when he's when she's in the suit, is really cool because he always shows up in like a bunch of smoke. He's like. <laughs> right before he kills somebody, he goes, Your angel of death awaits. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, Batman starts getting like uh, blamed for the murders of the criminals in town who's being killed, who are being killed by the Phantasm. The last criminal the Phantasm tries to kill is the Joker. You get like the showdown between the Joker and Batman, where the whole like place that the Joker's at starts blowing up. It's like a fire ground, and it starts blowing up. And the Joker's like voiced by Mark Hamill. He's like sitting there laughing, like, Ah ha ha ha! I can't. I can't do the Mark Hamill laugh at all, but uh, it's awesome. His Joker laugh is, and uh, just his dialogue is hilarious in the movie. Um, where he says stuff like, uh, uh, he calls Batman on the phone, he's going to like, blow up the bill Batman's end, he's like, um, the plane of the future is about to make you history, and there's no sense jumping out the window this time, toots. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's, uh, it's just great, his dialogue is. Um, you think Andrea, who is Batman's, like, ex-girlfriend, that's the character's name, you think she's dead at the end, but you find out she's actually not, so she, like, leaves Batman her locket, um, because, you know, she still loves Bruce, uh, and, um, you see her at the end on this boat out in the ocean, and this guy walks out there, and he's like, do you want some company or something like that, and she's like, uh, and she's, she doesn't really want anybody to talk to right now, and he's like, I'm sorry, do you want to be alone, and she's like, I am alone. And it's like a really sad ending, but uh, it works for the movie. It's it's, great. it's a great film. Another thing is, there's a little bit too many flashbacks, but uh, it's the movie's like pretty much told through flashbacks. The whole movie is, so it, it works for the story they're trying to tell with the whole origin of Batman and stuff like that. How he uh, became Batman for the first time in the animated series universe, and I love it when he first puts on the bat suit and Alfred looks at him like, my God, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, how he does it and everything, like with the with the music plan. The score is great. The score by Shirley Walker in the movie is great. Another thing I forgot to mention, the Danny Elfman score of the first two movies is great. I love the score in the first one, and I like the score in the second one. I would love to get the CDs of uh, the first two movies, and even this one. I, hell, I even like the score of Batman Forever. Uh, but, but overall, the Batman Forever score is the weakest of the four movies I've done so far. But yeah, cool movie. Check it out. And when the police are, like, after Batman in the movie, and they're, like, trying to shoot the hell out of him, and he's, like, trying to get away from the cops, awesome action scene. Really worth checking out. The best animated Batman film by far. 
Okay, now the ones we've been waiting for. I have the Nolan set here. Batman Begins, Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises. I love the cover to this and how it like becomes the other movies. That is awesome. Let's pop this sucker out. That like a little slider. Whoa, shit. <laughs> Forgot what was all in here. Oh, uh, digital collection things. Uh, I'll never bother with that. A cool little booklet that covers uh, the Nolan movies. You must become fear is what it says on the back. <clears throat> the art and making of the Dark Knight trilogy. You get the villains on back here. Bane. Joker, Ra's al Ghul, Scarecrow, Two-Face, and Catwoman. All the main villains pretty much from the Nolan films. Yeah, Batman Begins. Then you got... Give me a second here. Dark Knight, then Dark Knight Arises. Okay, as far as the films go, I'll go ahead and say it. Dark Knight's my favorite Batman film. I love it. I love the realistic like feel that Christopher Nolan tries to give his Batman films. I love that. Um, I do like the comic book feel too that the two first two Tim Burton movies had. But I'm also a big sorry I'm burping. <laughs> I also really like the realistic feel that uh, Christopher Nolan goes for here. And I like Christopher Nolan better as a director than Tim Burton, even though I'm a bigger fan of Tim Burton's overall films than I am Christopher Nolan. I think Christopher Nolan's a better director. Um, but uh, but I do think that in making Batman even more realistic than what he normally is, I think some of the fun of the character is lost just a little bit in that transition because Gotham City doesn't look anywhere near as good. And the bat suit does not look as good as the one from the Tim Burton movies. <clears throat> but uh, Christopher, I mean, but Christian Bell as Batman is great. Pretty, and uh, my favorite Batman films are Dark Knight. My second favorite is Batman Begins because it's the only movie that's a straight up movie just about Batman, really. Because Batman is like the whole movie is his origin, which I love. Finally, get Batman's origin on film. Uh, you get Batman's parents being gunned down, Batman training with Ra's al Ghul. Uh, he's, Ra's al Ghul is like Batman's mentor, but Batman doesn't want to kill people, but Ra's al Ghul does. So he leaves Ra's al Ghul, he leaves the League of Shadows, Batman does in the movie. Um, goes back to Gotham City, gets the bat suit, starts whooping ass, takes on the Scarecrow, takes the Scarecrow out. Uh, Batman Begins is not perfect, though. No movie is. One weakness is that the Scarecrow uh, doesn't get to doesn't get to do as much in the movie. Like, like it's cool that Batman gets to face him as the first major villain he faces when he comes back to Gotham City. <clears throat> but uh, later on in the movie, when the fear gas gets released in Gotham everywhere and everybody's going crazy, and the Scarecrow's like riding on a horse, he just gets like tasered in the face by uh, Katie Holmes, who plays pretty much like Batman's love interest in the movie. And he just like rides off into the night screaming, you know, because he got tasered in the face, which probably would hurt like hell. That's the last you see of him. And that's like a letdown. He should have got to do more than that. That's especially since Cillian Murphy plays him in the movie. Yeah, or, or Killian Murphy, I'm not sure how you say his name. The guy from 28 Days Later. But he does a great job playing him, and he really makes you want to see more of him. So that's a letdown. But Liam Neeson is still great as the main villain, though. Scarecrow is pretty much the secondary villain. Um, but Liam Neeson's great as Ra's al Ghul, and he comes to the city, you know, want, uh, to, to destroy the city because he views it as too corrupt. He's pretty much like the extreme version of Batman. Instead of uh, dealing with crime by trying to st uh, trying to stop it, uh, he pretty much wants to just eradicate it at the root, just kill everything, any place infested with too much crime. He just wants to eradicate completely, just no matter how many innocent people may be there. <clears throat> but uh, so Batman has to stop. Him. Uh, Ra's al Ghul wants to use the fear gas, the Scarecrow's fear gas, to poison the city. Uh, another thing is the ending of the movie is uh, Batman. Uh, Ra's al Ghul messes up the train that's got the, the, the fear toxin in it, I believe, or some kind of emitter thing that's going to make the fear gas travel even further through the city and consume even the rest of the city. Uh, 
uh, consume even the rest of the city. I mean, instead of, instead of the little bit it's already got. And uh, Razagul messes up the train, though, and uh, it can't be stopped. And so uh, Razagul's like, have you finally learned to do what's necessary? And Christian Bell goes, I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you. And he just flies out of the train, and Razagul dies in the, in the train. Which, I'm like, this is Christopher Nolan's version of Batman. This version of Batman keeps, like, in spirit. It keeps in spirit with the, the more modern comic book version of Batman, the one that doesn't kill. And I just couldn't picture Batman at all just leaving somebody to die like that, regardless. No, not saving somebody is not the same thing. It's not the same thing as killing them himself. It's pretty close. Uh, but uh, still, I just couldn't picture the comic book Batman doing that. I just couldn't. Um, but at the same time, it is Ra's al Ghul's own fault he's in the situation, and he is the one that messed up the train to cause this to happen to himself. But at the same time, I just could not picture Batman doing that. But the rest of the movie makes up, uh, but because the movie's so much fun up until then, and the story is like so much fun with really getting inside Batman's head and everything, and why he wants to do this shit and all that, and his connection with Alfred. Uh, and Alfred played by Michael Caine is great. Yes, I like him better than Michael Goff. But that's mostly because he gets even more to do and he's better written. And uh, the relationship between Alfred and Batman is better written than the first uh, Batman movie with Michael Keaton. Um, and also, Gary Oldman as Commissioner Gordon is great. His relationship with Batman is once again better written than the Michael Keaton movie. But uh, <clears throat> the score in this movie I don't like as much as the Danny Elfman score from part one. I'd say it's probably... I'd say it's better than the score from part two, though. Uh, Batman Returns, it is. I mean, or not so much better, but it's just as good, at least, because this score goes from a completely different vibe because it's a completely different style of Batman. But still not as good as the score from the first Batman movie, though. Not to me, anyway. Uh, that score will always be classic. But, um, yeah, the ending, though, more than makes up for it because you get a, a little nod to the Joker where Gary Oldman, who plays Commissioner Gordon, is like, um, what about escalation? You know, uh, we start carrying more powerful weapons, they start carrying more powerful weapons than us. We start wearing uh, Kevlar, they buy armor-piercing rounds, and now look at you. You know, you're wearing a bat suit, jumping off uh, rooftops and buildings and all that shit. And uh, so obviously things are going to escalate, you know, from that. Criminals are going to adapt to that. So... You know, what about this new guy? He leaves a calling card. Uh, it's like a, it's a Joker playing card. That's awesome right there. That ending was great. Uh, and then you get like pretty much the setup for the fact that Batman's gonna eventually start working on uh, an even, you know, bigger hideout or bat cave or whatever because his house got burned down. So he's gonna rebuild the the house but change certain things in it to accommodate like the new bat cave and other hidden stuff he has and shit like that. Morgan Freeman's also in the movie. He's the guy that makes like Batman's gadgets or whatever or sells them to him, which is cool. Another thing is the Batmobile in this movie. It's called the Tumbler. Uh, it's like a, a black tank. It's nowhere near as cool as the uh, Batmobile from the, the first two Tim Burton movies. I would even say I like the Batmobile from Batman Forever better than this one. But all in all, Christian Bale is my favorite Batman, though, because even though his Batman voice is not as good as Michael Keaton's, and he, uh, uh, but his the character is much better developed than Michael Keaton's. Michael Keaton's was going for like the shadowy, in the shadows, you're never going to know that much about me, Batman, or how I think and stuff, you just got to kind of see it with my facial expressions, but you're never going to really get inside my head, kind of Batman, but with the Christian Bell Batman, you really get inside his mind, you get to know what he's thinking, so with that, so that allows you to have more of a deeper connection to the character, so that makes you root for him more, and uh, <clears throat> then you probably did the Michael, then you probably would the Michael Keaton one, just a little bit more than the Michael Keaton one. No matter how good Michael Keaton's performance was, you still were never, like, super emotionally connected to him. You rooted for him because he was cool, not because you, like, were really connected to him, though, in my opinion. But, uh, and Michael Keaton as Batman, though, his Batman, I do think, was, is cooler than the Christian Bell ones. But the Christian Bell ones, it's easier to root for, in my opinion, because you're more connected to him. <laughs> and he's also more interesting to me as a person and as a character. So therefore, he comes off more likable because I know more about him, um, in my opinion. But he still doesn't give off as cool a vibe as the Michael Keaton. But he, but Christian Bell's still great. I mean, I like how he plays up the stupid billionaire Bruce Wayne. This is the first time we've ever had a really good balance between Bruce Wayne and Batman. <coughs> and once again, in my opinion. Okay, and as for the Dark Knight, 
greatest superhero ever. Greatest greatest superhero movie ever made, in my opinion. Heath Ledger, best villain, comic villain ever. He's great as a Joker. Yes, he's better than Jack Nicholson. He's scarier than Jack Nicholson. Um, Christian Bell, once again, is fine as Batman. Uh, every now and then, though, he overdoes the Batman voice. I, I, I was fine with his voice in the first movie. But in this one, whenever he tries to like give a normal speech, like a normal conversation, whenever he tries to have a normal conversation, the voice just sounds awkward. Um, the Joker kills Batman's girlfriend in the movie. That's cool. Uh, this movie's pretty much flawless, except for uh, one one scene of Batman having a normal conversation with the Joker, talking about how the city uh, has showed you has showed the Joker it's ready to believe in good. But the way Batman's saying it with his rough. Uh, sounding voice just comes off as silly. That's the only scene where it's where the movie's kind of out of it. Other than that, this movie is almost perfect to me. Maybe maybe one other scene where the Joker says, "Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you stranger." <laughs> I'm like, that's a little bit silly. Uh, but uh, Heath Ledger really won me over though when he does the pencil trick. He wraps this dude's head down on a pencil. That's great, and all through the movie where he keeps saying uh, different stories about how he uh, got the scars on his face. That's awesome how Heath Ledger plays that. And just the way Heath Ledger acts as the Joker, he gives off a more intimidating, uh, like, uh, he, he gives off a more intimidating vibe than Jack Nicholson's character did. But Jack Nicholson's character, I'll admit, was more fun, uh, but Heath Ledger's version is a lot scarier. Uh, um, and uh, the, like, the scars cut on his face to like add to the smile and enhance it or whatever is uh, is really cool. Um, two Face, played by Aaron Eckhart, finally get a good Two Face, you know, in a movie. Uh, two Face is not like the star of the movie. His character comes along way after, uh, in, towards the climax of the movie. Sorry, I'm gonna bend down here for a little bit. Yeah, Two Face comes in like way after, towards the uh, climax of the movie. He's He's fine. I love Aaron Eckhart's like they use like an actual what a realistic burn victim's face would look like in the movie. They use that style for Two Face's face. <coughs> Sorry, I believe I am getting sick, so I'll try my best to wrap these reviews up as quick as I can before I get even sicker. But yeah, they use a realistic burn victim like face for him, and it looks awesome. And um, um. When Two Face like uses the coin gimmick correctly this time, and whatever it lands on is the choice he makes, whether it be good or bad. He would even kill himself at one point if it would have landed on, you know, um, um, the right, the the correct side for him to shoot himself. He would have killed himself in the movie. He kidnaps Gordon's son because he blames Gordon for like the death of um, uh, the death of a uh, Rachel Dawes. I, I called her Batman's girlfriend earlier in the movie, but really she's Harvey Dent's girlfriend because she wants to be with Harvey Dent. She doesn't want to be with Batman. Um, but she gets killed in the movie. Uh, Two Face, um, after Two Face in the explosion though, I mean Harvey Dent in the explosion gets part of his face burnt. And that's how he becomes Two Face. He loses his mind after his girlfriend, you know, dies. Rachel Dawes dies, played by Maggie Gyllenhaal this time instead of Katie Holmes, which is an upgrade because Katie Holmes just looked wrong for the part in the first movie. I didn't even hate her in the first movie, but she just looks like a little kid. Um, I've never found Katie Holmes hot except in the movie Disturbing Behavior. I thought she was hot in that movie. That's the only movie I've ever found her hot in. Any other movie, she just looks like a little a little kid to me. But um, Maggie Gyllenhaal is an upgrade, in my opinion, acting-wise. <laughs> and um, she looks correct for the character. But Two-Face, yeah, at the end of it, is getting ready to shoot Gordon's son in the head. So it's like, damn, this shit just got dark. This is the darkest Batman movie ever made. The first movies have, the first two movies have dark stuff in them. But because they're done in a more comic book style, <clears throat> the darkness doesn't seem as real to you when you're watching them, which I love the comic book style, but I will admit in the more realistic style, the darkness is more serious <clears throat> when you watch it. So, therefore, it just makes the movie come off as darker <clears throat> because of its style. You get the bat pod in the movie, um, which is really cool. Great action scene with it in the middle of the city. Um, and Heath Ledger as the Joker is great. He's the best part of the movie, period, hands down. He blows up a hospital in the movie uh, when he's wearing a nurse's uniform, which is hysterical. Um, and then at the end of the movie, Two-Face is getting ready to shoot uh, Gordon's kid in the head, and Batman tackles him. And because he tackles him, 
they fall off the top of a ledge, and Two Face breaks his neck on the, in the fall, and Batman gets shot, <clears throat> and um, he's like limping away because sorry about that, I almost dropped the computer because Batman takes the blame for Harvey Dent's murders, so the city won't lose hope in its regular, you know, public officials or whatever. So the city, you know, spirit won't be completely broke and just give up hope and just not even give a shit what happens to their city anymore because of everything that's happened in the movie with all the shit the Joker's done. <clears throat> One thing uh, I, I kind of didn't like about the Two-Face, though, is that he's not completely like the comic book version because the one in the comic book had an actual split personality. This one here just has kind of like a dark side where he has anger problems. But he never really has a, a, a split personality, though. But he's still really close to the comic book character. Really close. Like 99% there. And even in spirit. But he's still pretty much the character in spirit, though, is what I'm trying to say. But, uh, yeah, Two-Face gets killed at the end. Two-Face also is not really a villain here. He's more like a victim himself. <clears throat> who's just like taking his rage from everything that's happened, you know, with the Joker killing his girlfriend and how and what's happened to his face. He's just taking his rage out on the um, the people he views responsible, like corrupt cops and shit, which is cool. Uh, the movie's also kind of structured like good and the bad and the ugly, with um, Batman being the good, you know, Two Face <clears throat> being the ugly. Of the of the city or whatever, or after what happens to him and him becoming Two Face, and with Joker being the bad, really, and you can, I mean, it kind of gives off that vibe to me. I don't know. I maybe it may just be in my head. Fuck, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> at the end of the movie, um, Two Face is dead. Batman takes the rap and he like limps away and jumps on his bat pod, gets the hell out of there. He's gonna be hunted down for the police. If, I mean, by the police after this incident, the police are gonna start hunting him down. So it's like, you know, damn, that's hardcore ending. So great movie. Terrific film. Easily four stars. I mean, shit. Come on. Not a surprise here. To be honest, this is my second favorite uh, movie. Well, no. I'd say this is this is either my second favorite or my favorite movie of all time. Inception is the... is Yes, it's another Christopher Nolan movie. Uh, I'm not really a Nolan fanboy. I do think he's a great director, but I don't love all the films he's made. But I do like most of them, and I do love most of them, honestly. But I don't love them all, but most of them I do love. <clears throat> but um, um, but I do really love Inception, and Inception and this movie are really neck and neck for my favorite film. I'd have to watch Inception again, but just for this movie, four stars, terrific film. <coughs> Once again, I'm sorry about the coffin. Okay, now for Dark Knight Rises, Bane, uh, he's fine in the movie. He never comes to the level of the Joker. Uh, never. He never even makes it close to being as cool as the Joker. Bane, no matter how much they try to amp him up as a character, he's only popular for breaking Batman's back. And even in the comic when he did that, he had a bunch of other characters like Fat Batman before then who all like wore him down. Like Bane releases all the criminals from the prison, I believe, in the comic. And that's what wears Batman down for Bane to be able to take him out. It takes all that just to wear him down for Batman. I mean, it takes all that just to wear Batman down for Bane to be able to break his back. So I'm like... It kind of makes Bane look a little pussified to me. I mean, no matter what they do to Bane, it just seems like that's the only thing cool he's ever really done, and he's always going to be kind of on the B list. I mean, I still think he's a really good character, but I don't think he's worthy of, like, the A-list Batman characters. I mean, bad guy-wise. But I do think he's a really good Batman villain, but I don't think he's, you know, quite ready for the A-list. Um, but um, as far as he goes in the movie, no, he's not as good as the Joker. But he's still really cool. But another, once again, um, that I, to go along with what I've said before, because Nolan's making things more realistic, he's kind of taking away a little bit of the fun in some places of the comic book characters. I miss Bane's um, steroid venom that he uses to make himself super huge. That kind of weakens the character a little bit to me. They, they still keep the essence of who the character is in the comics, but they take away some of his cooler attributes, like the venom stuff. That's one of the coolest things about Bane. About Bane. I mean, fuck Bane. That's one of the coolest things about him. Um, so they take that away. And that, that makes the character, once again, weaker. Um, but yeah, he's still good in the movie. Tom Hardy does a really good job playing him. Uh, he only becomes hard to understand 
like when he's talking. When he's talking, he only becomes hard to understand in the scenes when he tries to sound more intelligent because they want to make him smart as well as big and buff. But when he tries to sound really smart, that's when uh, <clears throat> he um, is harder to understand. But uh, still, though, the character is really good. But he's not great like the Joker, though. But he is really good. Uh, all through the movie, it's pretty much Bane takes over the city. He wants to uh, give the city hope and then uh, kill the, kill everybody in the city when they all think that, you know, everything's going to go good. <sighs> I mean, he wants to give the people of the city hope and then take away their hope and kill everybody in the city. He pretty much wants to fulfill what Ra's al Ghul wanted to do in the first movie, which is kill it, kill Gotham, destroy it. Um, because he used to be a member of the League of Shadows. And you get Ra's al Ghul's daughter in the movie, which is no big surprise that she's going to be there. Because you get Marion Coulterlard, or Coulteroid, or however you say her name. She's like a hot French actor, or actress, I mean, in real life. And I'm not sure how you say her name, but she's French. She's hot. <clears throat> She's in the movie. She's fine, but you know she's going to end up, you know, being Ra's al Ghul's daughter. You know she is. And then at the end of the movie, it's like, ooh, big surprise. And it kind of weakens the character of Bane a little bit. Because all through the movie, you think he's going to be the main villain. Now, at the last minute, they switch it. Well, it's not so much that he's like a lackey of Talia's. But it's like he's second in command with it being her plan and him being like the big badass who carries it out, you know. Kind of like the main enforcer. Not so much a lackey, but being like, you know, the muscle of the two. But still, though, he would have been better if he would have just been the main villain. Because he carries the whole movie. And she's just not as interesting. She just feels kind of thrown in. <clears throat> and also, you get Joseph Gordon-Levitt at the end. Who who is like a little tribute to the character Robin. Where they're like... They're talking about his character, and they're like, Why don't you just... You, you should use your real name. And they go... I like it better. Uh, yeah, what is it again? Robin or something like that. They say your real name's Robin. And I'm like, you didn't need that. That's stupid. I like Robin, but it still feels really forced in and non-needed. Yeah, all in all, I'd give Dark Knight Rises four stars. It's still uh, still a really great, it's still a great movie, but it's not a fantastic movie like the first two. But it's still great. It's the weakest of the three. Batman does get his back broken in the movie. Um, but he, he comes back after working out and shit, and he whoops Bane's ass at the end in a, in a decent fight. It's not anything to write home about. Nolan's action scenes in these movies are a little weak sometimes. The action scenes in Dark Knight, I think, are better than the action scenes in this movie, really. They have more impact, at least, <clears throat> which makes them better to me. You get the bat plane in this, though, um, and you get like uh, it flying around the city shooting missiles and stuff, which is kind of cool. But you still don't get anything as impactful action-wise as you did in The Dark Knight. Uh, Talia dies in the movie. Uh, like She's in a truck and it crashes, I believe, and she gets killed in the vehicle while she's driving it. Uh, so she kind of gets killed really quickly. All the actors from the last two movies were fine. Yeah, all the actors in the movie do fine, really. Tally is just not that interesting in the movie. She she feels forced in, and um, the Robin thing was stupid as well. Joseph Gordon-Levitt plays a cop in the movie who's like helping out Batman or whatever, and his real name being Robin. That's stupid. You didn't need that. One thing I'm surprised about though is that they actually give Batman a happy ending. This is like one of the only mediums of Batman I've seen where Batman or the darker Batmans I mean that I've seen where Batman actually gets a happy happy ending. Him and Catwoman like go off to live happily ever after and he doesn't have to be Batman anymore because he's inspired the actual city of Gotham to stand up for itself and quit being pussies <laughs> and letting you know the bad guys overrun him. <clears throat> so he doesn't have to be Batman anymore. A lot of people thought Batman was going to die at the end of this movie for some reason. I never thought Batman was going to die at the end of this movie. I'm sorry, but you would have to be delusional. I mean, not. I shouldn't say that. I don't want to be mean to people, but I'm sorry, but you must have. You must have really thought they were going to take a chance if you thought Batman was going to die at the end of this movie. There, I, I knew there was no way they were going to kill Batman in this movie. No way. But um. They actually try to make you think he's dead, but I knew that just for the fact the scene went on like just a couple seconds further, I knew that Batman was not going to die in this movie. I just knew it. It's obvious. 
I mean, I even knew it before I even went and watched the movie. But uh, <clears throat> I'm not saying you're dumb for thinking that he was going to die. I'm just saying you must have really thought they were going to go all out if you thought they were going to kill Batman. Which I knew they wouldn't go that far. I just, I mean, I, I just knew that they there was no way they would kill the hero. They just wouldn't. Not in a summer blockbuster or a blockbuster movie. I mean, there's just no way. <clears throat> I mean, it would have took. I mean, not in a superhero blockbuster anyway. They wouldn't. Have, I just knew they wouldn't have done it in a superhero blockbuster. If they would have, honestly, I'd I'd be like, damn, that took some balls. I mean, seriously. <laughs> But I just really had a feeling that they wouldn't do it. But, um, uh, but yeah, um, Catwoman in the movie played by Anne Hathaway. Anne Hathaway's hot. Her as Catwoman is, is great. She plays like the comic book style Catwoman, uh, where she's a, a thief. I like that. She's much closer to the comic than Michelle Pfeiffer was. <coughs> I think the... <coughs> I think the Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman though was more interesting, but the the Catwoman here though, with uh, played by Anne Hathaway, is more fleshed out. I prefer this Catwoman to the Anne Hathaway. I mean to the Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman. Even though I even though I really like the Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman, I'd say I like the Anne Hathaway Catwoman just a little bit better, just a little bit better. And I like um, and I like I really like the fact she's closer to the comics. I'll be honest, I do. So he. Yeah, all in all, out of all the Batman films um, that I've reviewed so far here in these videos, I would say Dark Knight's my favorite. Batman Begins is my second favorite. The Tim Burton movie, the first one, is my third favorite. Yes, I like it better than Dark Knight Rises. After those three, I would say Mask of the Phantasm is my. I would say Mask of the Phantasm is my fourth favorite because I really like the animated series, followed by Dark Knight Rises, Batman Begins. And that's that's really it. I mean, not even put Batman and Robin on that. But shit, I just realized I forgot one Batman movie, the Adam West film. Haven't watched it in years. Um, I'll probably do one more Batman video to wrap up this franchise by doing the Adam West movie. I'll probably finish it off with that. Uh, so yeah. All in all, I really get a kick out of these movies. I love Batman. And I'll see you guys again with the Batman 60s movie review for the final end of the Batathon. And uh, after that, I'll be jumping back into doing some more horror films. And then after I do some more horror films, I'll finish off the rest of the Jurassic Park movies. So, hope you guys have a wonderful day. And I'll see you guys again with the final Batathon video.